Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, We're going team by team. I would be very careful about slaying so, Am I going to get sued? Are going to legal on this? Let's send you out on the right note. Uh, PFF sucks. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast, Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson. We're live on YouTube. We, I'm extra loud today. Are we glitching? Yeah, we're a little glitchy like on running... that. That's just on the monitor. That's okay. not the real TV. Who knows? Live on YouTube, talking all things NFL draft. Oh, boy. Wow. I got my got my volume on my computer. I'm just unprepared to hear Again, today. just scratching the surface unprepared. of professionalism. Not even close to professionalism. <laughs> it's going to be a great show, though. It's going to be a great show. The other day, we did a little mock drafting, a little team needs mock draft. That was fun. I think it did have... Less hate than most. Yeah. It? Right? Well, that's what we speculated. Just appease, just appease the fans. Doing the bad thing that everybody wants you to do. Yeah. Just appease the fans. Who Unfortunately, cares? Unfortunately, that, that does rather signal that we are very, very susceptible to just peer pressure. Oh, yeah. I mean, we know. I mean, I was... You give um, us enough hate, we'll stop doing what you don't want us to do and start doing something stupid. Lion's social media account bullied me last year. I mean, it's... They it did. It's fine. I made the comment that, you know, I'm not even going to get into it. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a show today. Um, there's a lot of you know we're always trying to figure. Out, I, I love the midweek show because we could just ramble more than usual about yeah. whatever we want. This gives this is the one that gives us this the is, freedom. Yeah to, yeah, to diverge from what we're actually talking about. But today in particular, there's there's a lot to discuss because yesterday a massive rule change in the NFL, overhauling the kickoff. So we'll discuss the new kickoff rule in the NFL. Um, do you have those rules handy, by the way? I can't believe you, of all people, want to talk about the new kickoff rule. I do, because it, it might actually be more exciting. I might actually watch some kickoffs now. Okay. So, I, I mean, I have a couple high-level takes on the kickoff rule. Yeah? That's it. That's it? Yeah. You don't, and then you're not the, going to go in, in depth. And I want to discuss the J.J. McCarthy hype. Okay. Because there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of... Um, a lot of smoke. And we've got some questions. And then we have some mailbag questions. So we appreciate everybody always emailing us, NFL Podcast at pff.com. Have some emails to go through. So you want to start with the kickoff rule? I don't, but you evidently do. So Oh, it's in the title. Let's go. And so we have to discuss it. Any other NFL rule that you want to discuss? We discussed it on Monday. So if you missed us discussing the hip drop tackle that we we broke that like we broke that news broke the news live on monday yeah we discussed the hip drop tap the hip drop tackle uh it later emerged that apparently that logan wilson tackle where he tackles mark andrews and broke his leg uh apparently that's not a hip drop tackle under the nfl's <laughs> definition now and they the video that they posted to, or that they sort of showed people to illustrate this thing was out that was further confusing. So now I don't really know what they've banned. So everything we said about the hip drop tackle, I'm not sure it actually applies because I don't really know what the NFL has banned if that is a legal tackle now. <clears throat> and the single biggest problem with the whole thing was what we identified in that video, which is there's no way the NFL is capable of identifying this on the fly and calling it properly. I mean, that's exactly the problem with yes. the whole thing, right? As I... Um we gotta we gotta go back to the clip next I year did, however, in week seven when there's yeah. a call that we're talking about on a Monday morning at seven a.m. that ruins the night on Sunday night football because of a hip drop tackle that put a team into game winning field goal position. I did, however, successfully rile up everybody by posting a sequence of rugby tackles to prove that it is in fact possible to tackle people without you know using a hip drop or simply a smaller person tackling a larger person without getting run over. I know this was a this was a great time for you to shine. I did. Really is. I called you the world's world's world yeah. in a world of billions of people. I had. The world's foremost. Let me give you your compliment before you interrupt me, please. The world's foremost NFL slash rugby analyst. Thank you. It's you. I had carry on. I had multiple people in the in the tackling community re reach out to me on the back of this. I had a I had a coach 
for a super rugby team. That's the Southern Hemisphere, Australia in this case. Of course. I had a coach for a super rugby team reach out to me bitching about Americans not understanding how to tackle. I then had a rugby player, a professional rugby player, and an international rugby player, same person, not too different, reach out to me. This man is doing a PhD in the art of tackling. A hero of yours, even. I, I wouldn't. Anyway. No. The man is doing a PhD in the art of tackling. Reached out to, to talk tackling techniques. There's a tackling community. Apparently. I was unaware of this until tweeting about tackling, but multiple people from this community have reached out to me. Maybe you're not really the foremost expert on anything. These, the people in the tackling community I getting would, PhDs might I be. would have to lean on my, my NFL part of that, which is dangerous. Given. I'm a little worried that you might leave the podcast. You might leave me for a role with the NFL. The NFL might need to hire you to help with their safe or just, tackling. Or just to set up a tackling podcast. Apparently a that's where it's podcast. at. Me and, me and the PhD could just set up our own podcast talking tackling techniques. Podcasts are very uh, niche these days. That's getting niche. The tackling niche, I'm sure, would uh, maybe it'll take off. Maybe. Uh, so, um, the basic rule. Do you have the rules handy? Because I, I don't want to go through like the specifics. I mean, look. Kevin I don't even C remember. I, I honestly don't remember the exact yard line where the blockers 35. are supposed to. Oh, from the, so here. Kevin Seifert has a tweet that he is sort of with the illustration on it. Uh, let's see if yeah. that works. There you go. Because I've got the basic gist. All I know is it, it's going to look more like a run play. It's going to look more like a run play. Yeah. So we've heard, we've heard people before. So the, the traditional kickoff versus, I don't know, so you want to. Do you want to read all this? No, no, no. This is all you. I, I am merely a passenger for your love for the new kickoff rule. The, the ball's kicked from the 35-yard line. That's the same. All kicking team players other than the kicker will line up with one foot on the receiving team's 40-yard line. So they're on the receiving team's side of the field. And the kicker cannot cross the 50 until the ball's touched. The 10 kicking team players cannot move until the ball hits the ground or the player in the landing zone. Or in the end zone. So we got to have all these new new terms here. Um, and then the receiving team, they're in the setup zone. Five-yard area between the 35 and the 30, where at least nine receiving team players must line up. So you could have two returners back, is that right? And then yeah. nine sitting there blocking. <laughs> um, so basically, they're, they're all within five to ten yards of each other. The, the return team and the kickoff team, for the most part. So being within five to 10 yards of each other, that's what takes away the massive collisions where you're running 30, 40 yards and then you know um, hitting each other. So that's where it's more of like a short area blocking game. And so now the traditional, we've talked about this a lot, like the difference between kick and punt returners. Every time you call Kadaro Patterson, the greatest returner yeah. of all time, you get the Devin Hester people mm -hmm. that come in and like, no, no, it's Devin Hester. And I think the thing I always like to remind people is that even the old traditional kickoff return and the punt return are completely different skill sets. There are certainly some people who could do both, right? The old, like Eric Metcalf used to do that back in the day, right? Brian Mitchell, didn't he do both? Yep. There are certain skill sets where you do both. But to oversimplify, the punt returner is more of a shifty, short area space, one cut, you know, get up the field type of guy. And then the, the kick returner is a more of a running back type of style, right? Like read some blocks. You know, same thing, like, you know, hit a hole, but you're, you're reading blocks, setting up blocks, and then, you know, having a little bit, you know, different type of vision. So I think oversimplifying the punt return was more of a receiver, shifty return, uh, shifty type of player, and the kick returner could be more of like a running back type of style. It feels like this is even more so now the running backs, I think, will make for the best kick returners here, but especially the running backs that – have the explosiveness to take it to the house. Um, so it does, and then it changes things just from a blocking perspective. The players, and uh, Eric Galco, who runs the Shrine Bowl, he does, um, he had a really good tweet about this. I mean, the whole history of this is fascinating how we even got here. We can talk about that in a minute too. But Galco does a really nice job saying this has team building implications because you have different types of players that you're looking for. You're blocking tight ends, you know, maybe your 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 fifth string linebacker. Those guys on both sides of the ball are going to be really important here because it's it's more of a line of scrimmage type of play. Not exactly, but it's closer to a line of scrimmage play now than it is the old traditional kickoff. So it's just um, that part's interesting from a strategy standpoint. Yeah, I mean it's designed to bring back the kickoff, essentially. Bring back the kick return as a play as opposed to just a ceremonial touchback at the start of games, at the start of the half. And immediately, when they passed this, Cordero Patterson got signed. Like Basically, the second this happened, Cordero Patterson signed to the Pittsburgh Steelers. So the greatest kick returner in NFL history 
uh, immediately got signed back to a team as soon as kick returns became a thing again. I was ready to make a joke about, oh, Patterson. I mean, but the Steelers were like, no, for real, we're bringing him in. Also, that's Arthur Smith, so he may well be their lead running back at this point as well. No, that's a good point. That's a really good point. That connection was probably already in the works. Um, again, this didn't surprise the NFL. It's not like personnel just found out yesterday that there was going to be a new kickoff. Obviously, this had been in the works. Um, so a couple new things here. The way, By the way, the history of this, a guy named Sam Schwartzenstein. Yep. Right? He was a uh, former Stanford offensive lineman. Schwartzstein, I think. Just there's Schwartzstein? No Schwartzstein. There's no Schwartzstein? N in the middle. Sorry. Schwartzstein, Schwartzstein, whichever one it is. Okay. Well, Sam did a really good job. You know, he's been – he drew this thing up for the XFL a couple years ago. That's why I brought up Eric Galco, who runs the Shrine Bowl now. He was um, a part of the XFL as well. Um, but Sam, you know, he works with uh, Next Gen Stats now or uh, Amazon Prime, does some of their advanced broadcast work. And uh, this was kind of his brainchild when the XFL was looking to make kickoff safer. And the XFL was a place where you can innovate, right? And that, that is a good win for spring leagues where you're just you're trying new stuff. Um, we're seeing this in baseball where they're using my old league, the Atlantic League, Sam, to experiment with all of the new rules that they eventually imp uh, implemented in, in Major League Baseball. They, they moved the mound back a foot or two in the Atlantic League. Isn't that nuts? crazy moving the mound back a couple feet they had the bigger bases they had the the pitch timer and some of those new rules were implemented at MLB so credit the NFL for looking to the spring league and looking to that data to be able to make some decisions yeah I mean it's essentially that XFL uh, kickoff play as I say it's designed to create more of a actually bring the kickoff back as opposed to just these ceremonial touchbacks one of the other elements with it is um, if you do kick a touchback the ball spotted at the 30 yard line so remember that used to be the 20 then it became the 25 so they are systematically making it less advantageous effectively to just boot the ball out of the back of the end zone and take the touchback so here's my take on it and I, again I, I apologize I should have done more research on this I don't know what the XFL average starting field position was right um, so that's going to be the interesting point for the NFL what the XFL did though they had a touchback put the ball at the 35. So that was even more extreme. So the NFL said, no, touchback's not going to be at the 35. It'll be at the 30, which is, again, five yards closer than the 25. That's significant, though, yeah. five yards. I believe most NFL teams will still lean into just give me the touchback. That's what I'm thinking. Um, because they were getting to a point where the touchback being at the 25, they started, let's kick the ball short, let's kick the ball right on the goal line, let's kick it right to the one, let's put it in the corner a little bit, put a little air under it, and let's go try to tackle them before the 25 and steal some yards. You don't have that ability anymore. I think most teams are going to say just boot it through the end zone. But where this shows up, Sam, December and January games, where it is much more difficult. Any outdoor December-January game and, and playoff games that are outdoors, it is much harder to ensure the touchback um, certainly not booting it through the end zone, but even if you kick it five yards deep, it still might be better for the return team to, to take it out. So that's where I think this shows up. So I think it's a new rule. This is why I'm actually thinking about special teams. It's a new rule that I think has an impact in the most important games as the weather gets uh, less advantageous for kickers. Yeah, it, it is going to come down to what the average kick return ends up being, you know, relative to that touchback thing. I mean, the the NFL or NFL teams were already playing with that previously you know the, there was a while where everything was just getting booted out of the end zone because that was the definitely the best average starting field position you could get it also eliminated <clears throat> people like Cordero Patterson the guys that are genuinely threats to return it for a touchdown then you did start to get teams realizing that actually with this new touchback line you are getting better at being able to just drop it there at the goal line pin them back and make them return it and tackle them short of the touchback line so you were getting more kick returns deliberately um, because teams are better at covering it and now again we're forcing we're essentially in incentivizing teams to return it uh, but we've moved that touchback line even further up so it's going to be a season of playing around and figuring out where that balance is yeah so I think it's I think this has a this has an impact yeah we'll see what the balance is I think it puts um, again if, if teams you know if teams want to kick touchbacks they're going to make different kicker decisions here. Not every kicker is going to be Justin Tucker, you know, be able to boot it through the end zone every single time. Um, again, the other aspect of it, I'm actually interested in the kickoff return strategy because, like I said, it, it's like a 
glorified line of scrimmage type of play, there's there's going to be run concepts, basically. They're going to run yeah. power and counter and outside zone. Like They're going to run actual run type of schemes, basically, for the, the kickoff return here. You know what are you going to do with you know the the up back essentially the second you know your second return are you going to make that a fullback type are you going to actually have bring back two returners like you like you had back in the day like there's a lot of you know nuanced strategy throwback plays there's a lot more on the table here I think absolutely so I'm going to watch kickoffs this year wow look at that going to watch kickoffs until they just become all touchbacks I'm going to watch them in the playoffs probably. Also announced that the NFL is going to do a doubleheader on Christmas Day, which is a Wednesday. Yep. Here I am thinking might have a day off, Sam. Might be able to you know, hang out with the kids on Christmas. Player safety is paramount unless there's a TV block window we need to capitalize on, in which case, eh, unlucky. I mean, it's like the compliment sandwich, right? You just, you would do, we'll, we'll give you a little bit in player safety. We're going we're gonna to lose the hip drop tackle. Eh, we're going to make you come back for two Wednesday games, too. And Four asked, teams are playing on Saturday and then Wednesday. Right. They yes. asked Raj about it, and he was like, "That's eh, it's only one. It's not like we're doing it every week. So it's just a one-off because it's Christmas on a Wednesday. Essentially, <laughs> yeah, who cares? You know? Yeah, player safety and all that. But, you know, this one time we're going to need them to play on a Wednesday. I mean, if you think about it, then Christmas will be on a Thursday. They'll have a game. <coughs> Friday, they'll have a game. Saturday game. Sunday game. Monday game. And then the only other time they actually have to make a decision is when it's on a Tuesday again. But the other point that uh, – that Ben Stockwell brought up is, and this is another thing that the NFL has consistently shown they don't give a rat's ass about, um, that is a wild competitive imbalance to introduce right at the end of the season it's when the playoffs the are on the line, yeah. you know what I mean? That's the week before, it's between 16 and 17, right? It's not really an imbalance. What, the no, imbalance- it is, because, so the imbalance comes at the end of it, right? So four teams are going to get 10 days rest heading into arguably their most important game of the season. Relative to other people, yeah, that's but they're, huge. They're also after playing three games in what ten days, right? So it's a it's a radically it, they get screwed to begin with, and then they get a massive advantage heading into their biggest game of the season. That balances. That doesn't balance. It's an imbalance twice. They're going to have to play two different imbalances just because they work against each other. They're going to play Sunday, Saturday, Wednesday. So yes. Sunday, short rest on Saturday, and even shorter rest coming back on Wednesday, and then right. they get the extra. But it's not. There's that. no way that just balances itself out. That's not any different than a team getting a Thursday because Thursday night games go all the way through week seventeen, not eighteen. Yeah, but they're doing those as well. Yeah, I know, but it's not different. So it's an than extra the, imbalance being added to the most important week of the season. I mean, I think it's more of a negative than a positive for the teams playing on Christmas, to be honest. But of course, it's imbalance, right? Again, I've said this before. the The number one scheduling rule here is not competitive balance it's no it's attack all of the tv windows yes yes i mean we when when we go to the end of the season it's like how are we gonna how are we gonna do the week 17 game or the week 18 games how are we gonna move things around it's like not for competitive purposes no no but my point being even the people that are against this are just focusing on like oh player safety which is definitely a, a, a thing and obviously hypocritical for the nfl to be like oh safety is everything unless christmas is on a wednesday in which case screw them uh but it's also a wildly competitive imbalance thing to introduce like right at the most important part of the season and nobody's mentioning that yeah so, i mean i i agree yeah i mean they're obviously hypocritical when it comes to player safety and what you know the the, the the actual decisions that they make they don't just care about player safety i mean and i don't think they should just care about player safety then we literally would have flag football right i mean you would it'd be different so anyway anything else on rule changes no please no Please no, is what he says. There's nothing else, right? Can't, um, be, can't be anything else of substance. I mean, we can compliment the uh, two challenges again. No, no, no. no. Getting the challenges no, back, baby. Stop. It's huge. No. Let me tell you about fabric, though. Great. Is 2024 bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life? Well, here's a secret weapon to help you face those challenges with, with more confidence. It's a great term, life insurance policy. That's right. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your fam- family's financial future so you can focus on what's ahead, knowing your family is protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all 
online and on your schedule, you can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust, fa trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. That's meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash pffnfl. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. All right, a couple things here. Can, um, I, got, I reached out to Chris Sims, but it was via DM. Oh. Hasn't gotten back to me. It's tough to see DMs these, day, these days. It really is. On Twitter. X. Uh, it's easy on my phone. It X just doesn't, formally, it doesn't pop on TweetDeck the yeah. same way. I mean, so now, like, if uh, whatever the official, um, you know, the AP style guide or whatever people go by these days in, in journalism circles, it's now sort of officially known as X, formerly known as Twitter. You know, it's like that's, Prince, that's how you do the it. artist formerly known as Prince. Like, it's, we're not, we can't possibly just, we just go with X because that's silly. And yet, it feel it's not correct either to just call it Twitter and ignore the fact that it changed its name. So officially, we have to call it X, formerly known as Twitter. Yeah, you need to because you need to know what it's what you're talking. So about. X, formerly known as Twitter, has removed the the notification when you get a DM. You don't know I unless still you see go it on my phone. And I, I, I use TweetDeck where I have my messages on my main screen. You got to you got to move it over. I have it set allegedly to notify me when I get a DM, and I don't get the notification oh, lost it. via Twitter or via my phone anymore. I have to go looking for it to check that I get DM. Anyway, could somebody just ping Chris? Be like, hey, answer Steve or something like that. I'll just <laughs> I'll get his number. I can I can get to people. We want to have Chris on here. I can get to people. And people think that we're being negative when we talk about Chris Sims all the time. We're I mean, but we're joking. We like Chris. We have him on the show. He's a guest on the show. He's a friend of the show. We love having Chris on to discuss his rankings every year. So we want to do that soon. Um, let us know if there's any. Somebody has suggested Pete Prisco yeah. as a guest. Pete. I'd have Pete. He's always bold. Yes. He's bold every year. Yes. He was Hackenberg bold. Yes. Negative. But he was also Josh Allen bold. And he's Will Levis bold, too. He must love what Tennessee's been doing. Loves Will Levis. I think he had him QB one or two last year. So we'll yeah. try to get Pete. Um, so we're trying to get a few guests here coming up. Um, and I was going somewhere with that. Oh, because the quarterback, the quarterback discussion, as always, is all over the place here, Sam. The most recent buzz coming out of the owners' meetings is that the player at number two that Washington could be considering is J.J. McCarthy from Michigan. Now, I will say, Adam Peters, the new GM for Washington, coming from San Francisco, I don't think he's like, he's like, I, we don't have the guy yet. Like, they don't, they're not sold on who they're pick is at number two Jaden Daniels has his pro day today at LSU I mean they're really not this isn't based off of rumors in Washington is my point right this isn't like feelers in the building and it's like man they're they're high on JJ this is literally just buzz around the league yeah and I'm <clears throat> fascinated by this Tom Palacero was at the meetings and, and said in a segment somewhere that like he's asked a bunch of people what Washington is going to do and the most common answer he was getting back was JJ McCarthy which is wild. Like, he's gone from, he's the guy this year that's gone from, you know, middle of the first round, intriguing developmental prospect, potentially, to he's the second best guy after Caleb Williams. And, you know, the, the, the Russian judge in Jim Harbaugh being like, no, he's the best quarterback in the draft. I'm like, all right. And um, then Harbaugh said it was the best pro day he's ever seen. Right. And he wasn't alone saying that. Now, I don't Who know what... Who I only saw it from Harbaugh. No, which, somebody else said that Which as isn't well. a valid... It's not... That's, you're a historian. Jim Harbaugh is not considered a valid source. Is that correct? I mean, he's a valid source. He's just a wildly compromised source. Like you have okay, to, compromised yeah. source. Yeah. Um, you... I, I don't know what that means. Like, what is a great pro day performance... Like he, I know who else had great pro day performances. Just a few. But a lot of other people. A few yeah. quarterbacks off the top of my head. Uh, Jamarcus Russell. Yeah. Blaine Gabbert. Jamarcus Russell was the best pro day that Mike Mayock had ever seen. Right. Mayock said him. I think he said the same, th same thing about Gabbert. And I did ask the people if we did a watch along, which one. I think the 2011 draft might be the one. Okay. With, Zach Wilson had a great pro day. Zach Wilson did. Josh Allen also did. Right. Right. You have to throw a good one in there as well. I also just don't know. Like, at this point, they're running effectively. They're all doing the same thing. It's like you get whatever it is, 50 throws, one of which is that let's roll to your left, fire a 70-yard bomb. You know what I mean? It's There's the no same thing. There's no such thing as a great pro day. That's what – it's 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 almost binary at this point. It's like, did you hit most of your passes and did you attempt that one throw that everyone wants to see? If you did, great pro day. If you didn't, oh, not great. But like everyone, I don't, I don't understand how you can look like if you're Jim Harbaugh 
or anybody else saying it. What was the difference between his pro day and some and other like any other guy this year? We were like, that's one of the greatest I've ever seen. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't know what you do with it's that. It's weird to me. My uh, anyway, I, that's not. I don't even think that's why JJ McCarthy. I don't know if he's just. If it's just buzz, I don't know if the owners, if, if everybody colludes during those things, like, hey, let's, let's artificially raise somebody's stock. I don't know if it's the Patriots at three or the Giants at six, if there's teams who love Drake May, and it's just like, man, we need to do, let's put everything out there that we can. Uh, but, it, but it's not just coming from the NFL, right? It's not just coming from those who control the information, so to speak, via the, um, the mouthpieces that are insiders, right? It's not just coming from the NFL. It's also coming from evaluators, right? It's also coming from, say, like a Lewis Riddick at ESPN who loves Jaden Daniels, Dan Orlovsky who loves Jaden Daniels. That's a whole different story. Like a couple of those guys I think would put Jaden Daniels over Caleb Williams, which is a whole different discussion. Um, but there's actual evaluators out there who might have Drake May as QB three or four and actual evaluators who love J.J. McCarthy, I know Thor Nystrom, you know, listens, listens to us, always, you know, goes in-depth in the draft as much as anybody. He's a massive J.J. McCarthy propaganda artist, I'll say. Wow. I and mean, he's pushing the propaganda. No, because he believes it. It's not really propaganda. Push it. He loves J.J. McCarthy. So there's real evaluators out there that love J.J. McCarthy. Um, and that, like, pushing quarterbacks up and giving them buzz going into the draft is not surprising. I guess what I'm most surprised about is that Drake May is the one kind of getting pushed out in the uh, with all the buzz. Well, so what's interesting to me about the McCarthy thing is, okay, you, it's difficult because you can always find people who have it in a different order, right? Like as you say, Thor is going to have him maybe as his number one guy, whatever. There's always somebody out there who the order is completely different. And that, so you, you almost have to work from the consensus board, right? To just try and like... Let's try and sort through all of the noise and all of the data points, and let's try and get like a middle, a middle part of the bell curve and say, where are most people? Generally speaking, most people all the way through the process have been a big three, Caleb Williams, uh, Drake Bay, Jaden Daniels, uh, and then J.J. McCarthy as QB4, right? Now, if you look at the big board or the consensus big board, it's Caleb Williams, clear number one, and then it's Jaden Daniels, Drake May, 2-3, but they're close. And then you go down to number 11 to find J.J. McCarthy, who interestingly is only one spot ahead of Bo Nix, right? So that's kind of where the consensus is, right? Big three, really one and then two, and then a gap, and then two more guys, McCarthy and Bo Nix. But right from the beginning, there has been talk from the insider people, from the guys that talk to NFL people, who have been saying... Brace yourself, guys, because the NFL loves this guy way more than the consent than the people, than the people outside that aren't talking to NFL people. And obviously, Jim Harbaugh is the most extreme example of that, as the guy that coached him and has been saying from day one, like he's the best player in the draft, etc. But all the way along, those guys have been saying the NFL likes this guy more than you do, and that that's not dying away. That seems, if anything, to be growing even stronger. The closer we get, it's. I mean, as you say, like now. For whatever you can put a, a like, for whatever you can quantify the NFL's consensus, it's sounding like the NFL's consensus is Caleb Williams one, JJ McCarthy two. That's wild. Like that's a massive. D I mean, that's what the report is saying. Yes. Based off of hearsay at the owners' meetings, which is, I mean, everybody's there, right? Owners, GMs, yes. and head coaches. I, I'm not ready to buy into that though. But it and is like, it, if if it was just the first time we were hearing about it, it would be one thing. But it is simply one in a series of data points that have all been saying the same thing. So, yeah, we're in lying season right now. Everybody is, you know, not everything you hear is true. In fact, most of what you're hearing is probably not true. But this is tallying with everything we've been hearing about McCarthy all the way along, like before we got to lying season, which is the league seems to like this guy more than not the let, league. Let me compare it to past years. I want um, the 2021 NFL draft every Every year at this time, I try to think back to what was I thinking and what was happening at the time of the draft and whatever the year was. So the 2021 NFL draft, where, of course, we know five quarterbacks went in the first round, only one remains with his current team. That's Trevor Lawrence. But that was Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. Justin Fields, for a long time, was the consensus number two. 
all the way back to the point where Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields both played high school quarterback, uh, high, uh, high school football in Georgia. They were the top two prospects going into college. They were anticipated to be the top two NFL draft prospects coming out of their right. final season in 2020. And all along the way, of course, Trevor Lawrence remained that as QB1, but slowly Zach Wilson, well, I mean, pretty quickly, Zach Wilson became, yeah. he actually became consensus number two yes. quarterback. But the Fields thing, I never, I never personally bought into Fields dropping that much because I, I was like, man, there's just so much to like about Justin Fields, I was still convinced that he would go at number three to the Niners. Niners traded up to number three. I still thought Fields would go at three, but all of the smoke was around Mac Jones, and then late, it became Trey Lance. And it turned out, yeah, the NFL was much lower on Justin Fields maybe than people thought going in, and it became, you know, the Trey Lance became the guy. Um, Other times, though, then you have the Will Levis story last year. Will Levis... I think was a pretty consensus. I don't know. Was he consensus QB four for most? Yeah, probably. We, most people. I'm again consensus most majority. Bryce Young number one, C.J. Stroud number two, Anthony Richardson three, Will Levis four. I think most people had that. But the betting market week of the draft went nuts. Yeah. Right. And, and Will Levis became a massive favorite to go number two overall. I don't know. I don't know what influences the betting market to do that. But that happened week of the draft, right? So clearly, this is like nobody's doing QB evaluations anymore. No. Right? It's all working. Yeah. So, again, it's like trying to sift through all of the wild data points that are out there and trying to find whatever the closest to a consensus is or a general flow of information directionally. Um, I do feel like with Fields, so as you said, he was QB2 for a long time, but fairly consistently throughout that pre-draft process there was a lot of people that were negatively picking at fields and it was the league actually doesn't like him as much as the people so that i think is a good example in the opposite direction of i think fairly consistently throughout that process there was a directional flow of information from people that were talking to the nfl that were saying you guys all think this guy is qb2 now he he then became qb3 after Zach Wilson four. became... Q- he was four, yeah, after Trey Lance. No, 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 but it... Oh, oh, wise. the actual... Right. Yes. Like, it started off when it was him being clear QB2 consensus-wise, maybe even QB1, like the Drake May yeah, versus yeah. Caleb Williams thing. And then we reached a point where it became clear that Zach Wilson was consensus QB2 and Fields, I think, was three at that point. But all the way along, there was like a directional flow of information from insiders saying... Just beware, the NFL does not seem to love Fields as much as you guys do, right? And that ended up being exactly the case. This time, I think it's the opposite, where there's been this consistent tapping away at this information of the league likes McCarthy more than you guys do. So I guess we're all coming around to why. What, what does the league see in McCarthy that most other people don't? I, I will say, just going back to that really quick, I think – we always call this lying season. I feel like lying season is probably starting right about now. Yeah. I, I think when if the information's coming out around the combine and in early March, that is more, I would say, evaluator-driven, yes. right? Because what's happening in buildings at that point, leading into the combine... Coaches are involved. Right. But this is... Coaches are just getting involved. GMs are always involved, but they're, they're, they're getting the reports from the scouts presented to the building, so to speak, right? Well, so yeah. more around the building know what the scouts believe, and that's starting to get out more in early March. The, that's probably the real evaluation. And then as you get into April, now you're, now you're saying, okay, I pick it six. I'm the Giants. I really want this one quarterback. Now you start to lie yes. and get the people that you want right. to fall. So I think we're starting the lying season right yeah. now as boards are really being finalized. We've only, Yeah, exactly. We've only just reached the part of the process where teams have their boards set they have an understanding of what the draft is going to look like. They have an understanding of where everybody else is. And now they want to change that dynamic. So the only way of doing that is by lying and leaking scores and doing all those kinds of things, right? The most obvious. So now, now is when you need to start actually evaluating every single report that comes out. Where is that source coming from? What does that source have to gain by putting that out there? Is this legitimate information or is this bullshit? That's because why. Now... You're yeah. going to get people tweeting at you with everything that's come out. Oh, 
Patriots say this, right? Patriot, uh, the uh, Gerard Mayo just went on a big, long diatribe about how amazing the ceiling of Drake May is, right? How incredible this guy could be as a player. If you're not immediately, so if you're tweeting somebody going, Gerard Mayo and the Patriots love Drake May, right? If you're not asking yourself why Gerard Mayo would put that information out there voluntarily to people, you're not fairly evaluating the source. You're doing yourself and everybody else a disservice, right? You need to at least ask that question before you start throwing that at people as fact. This is what the Patriots slash Gerard Mayo think of Drake May. So that's where we are right now. Question everything now. All the information you hear from now until the draft, immediately question where it's coming from. Uh, All right, w- one more story on this whole thing. I remember in, in 2014, the first quarterback off the board was Blake Bortles, number three to the Jaguars. And uh, Daniel Jeremiah at that time said, he was like, I have never been lied to at that level by friends, by like <laughs> legitimate colleagues. He had no clue that Blake Bortles was going third. And I had heard, and uh, I've got a pretty good source on this, all right? I don't have many sources, but I had a good source. Mm -hmm. I don't care. I don't even know if he cares that I say this. But in the Jags building, they were putting up fake draft boards in the building. Nice. Before the draft. So scouts and other front office personnel in Jacksonville were looking at a fake draft board, and only one or two people knew had the real draft board that had Blake Bortles as QB1. So even in the building, they were so worried about leaks, and maybe they shouldn't have been, they picked Bortles at three, but that's the type of stuff that you're dealing with. And then other times, you have the Steelers, who every year it's like, man, they love Najee Harris. They're going to take Najee Harris, and then they take Najee Harris, right? I mean, it's just, it is amazing how different some teams and front offices approach it. But it's been to the point where literally two or three people knew what the Jags would do at number three at quarterback, including everybody in their own building who were lied to, essentially. It's like a canary trap. If I was a billionaire owner, I would absolutely set canary traps out there to identify the yeah. leak, the mold. Identify the leak. Yeah. I would, I would step in all of them. <laughs> I would step in all the traps. You would be the leak. Yeah, you would yeah. be the guy. I, would have I, just, to, I just did. I, just I would have to oust you because I, I would set the canary trap. You would tweet out. You would you know, leak the fake... Yeah. The fake uh, board. And then I'd be like, that's Steve's version. Get rid of him. I also think I, I want to every year start a fake, um, you know, fake rumor and see how, see how far it goes. Yeah. You know, I, a lot of teams have Spencer Rattler as QB3. Keep an eye on the Giants at six. You know, that type <laughs> of thing. Let's get that. Can we get that going? Let's get that moving. Spencer Rattler at six to the Giants. We've had some very good emails, actually, in recently about various strategies that the billionaire owner can employ. Uh, Luke Cook had a really good email that had a lot of cool suggestions and questions. Uh, We had another one that was too long to read out, but I just wanted to shout out Andrew Felt for a really good email about tanking strategy. That was really just, I like getting those emails, even if they are too long or too... too Are we getting into emails right now or do we want to put a... Well, so let's wrap this up. Put a bow on J.J. McCarthy. Yeah, put a bow on it simply by answering that question. If the league does, in fact, like him more than everybody else, why? Um, I think I think there's the personality aspect of it. I think they just like him. I think there's the aspect of, look, teams still lean into the winner thing. They still lean into that, right? Just won a national championship. They won. Um, I think in his favor, you saw a difference. You did see a difference in Michigan when he was under center over the last couple of years. You're talking about a Michigan team that took years to get over this hump. And obviously it coincided with the loaded roster. They're about to have 20 something guys drafted. Like they were loaded as not with, not with high end prospects with just NFL players though. Right. It's a loaded team. And they looked completely different when JJ was under center, you have all the third down efficiency, right. And how effective he was on third down. The negative was that, you know, they didn't rely on him. They didn't win because of him. They won with him. Um, But is that just a, just a product of that's how they wanted to play it. You can't hold that against him, right? And he's still young, and he's still young and developing, and you see, you see all the, the highlight reel traits and everything. So that's what they, that's what they like about J.J. McCarthy. So I'm like, I'm in, a, as always, I'm sitting on the fence here because I feel like the buzz for J.J. McCarthy being in the top half of the first round started at the time where things were real. The buzz of him at two, though, I'm not ready to buy into that yet. I'm not ready to think J.J. McCarthy's QB2 
around the NFL. I'm still believing. Honestly, I'm going to do what I did a couple years ago and say, I'm not, I'm going to die on the Justin Fields is going high uh, hill. I'm going to probably die on that one with Drake May. I'm, I think Drake May is QB2, will be QB2 for the Commanders until, I don't know, probably draft night, I think. But I would say I think it's May or Daniels still, and that the late hype from J.J. McCarthy is not real. I was on um, a the Washington's kind of official, whatever their media arm thing is, with Logan Paulson, the yeah. former NFL tight end, uh, and he made the point in one of his questions that, um, you know, Michigan's offense was running a lot more pro-style concepts than a lot of these other offenses. Like, to what extent do you think that NFL teams are swayed, essentially, simply by seeing things that they recognize and liking that? So with McCarthy... You don't have to project what he's doing into a new into a pro style offense and say, "All right, we've got the traits, we've got all these these reads that he's making, but it's very different to what we're going to ask him to do." How does this project to that? They can, there's less of them, but they can see them. Like they're actually looking at concepts that they run and seeing how he runs mesh and how he does all this sort of stuff, and go, "Yeah, I like that." Now he's only done it eight times in the last you know eight games, but it's there. Whereas with some of these other guys, it's like those aren't on their tape. They have to. They have to project what they're doing into something different. I think it's a very big factor. I think, um, I think especially, I think more so at the coaching level, right? Think about all those conversations, right? So the scouts, the scouts are evaluating these guys for multiple years now. They do all the work in the fall, and I'm not saying the scouts don't understand X's and O's, right? I think good, good, um, good teams will have that communication, which say, "Hey, scouts." Here's what we're looking for in our players. Here's what we want our quarterback to do. Here's what our offense does. But the scouts are, are definitely looking more at traits, right? So they're, they're giving their evaluations based off traits, ceiling, what this guy can do, off-field personality, that whole thing. That's, that's the fall into pre-combine. And then, as we said earlier, then the coaches start to get involved. And the coaches are definitely watching the film differently. They're saying, I know what I run, right? I know what we run as an offensive coordinator, as a quarterback coach, as a wide receivers coach. I know what we do. I want to see those plays, right? And with the power of PFF Ultimate, you can watch whatever plays you want at a click of a button, right? You know that. I don't have to sell it. Every team has it. Hmm. But that makes it easier to say, let me just see these concepts that we run, right? Let me see something similar to what we run. And absolutely, I mean, of the, if a guy has 1,000 dropbacks, you might lean into the 100 or so or the 50 that look like what you do and, and, and certainly evaluate that better. There's always a, high, you know, there's a holistic, like, how well does this guy process? What's his accuracy like? Of course you're going to look at that stuff. But, yes, I think coaches absolutely look at that aspect of things. And, um, yeah, it's, it is easier to evaluate something that you, you know they're going to do. All right. I have emails. You ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right, this one comes in from Jake Peters. Uh, hey, Sam and Steve. My question is, how do you determine what a reach is in a post-model trademark society? Historically, you guys have talked about the consensus board and how it should be influencing your draft decisions. Uh, just because he's your highest-ranked guy, you shouldn't take him three rounds before he's projected. But these axioms were developed in a pre-model world. Post-model, what, li- what are the limitations on your own evaluation? If you actually are a certain percentage better at identifying talent... How much are you letting the consensus still dictate your decision? Say last year, the model had said Puka Nakua had a first-round grade. Where am I allowed to draft him if the consensus says he's a fifth-round guy? Is the third a reach, or would we just never be confident enough in any evaluation system to say that any one team has an edge and can buck consensus? Love to hear what you guys think. Jake. Jake Peters, I think. Oh, that's a, so that's a really good question. Um, I, I have some thoughts. Yes. I have said before there's not a great history of looking at evaluators and 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 being overconfident in your own evaluations right Right. over the last 10 years the saints have been the best over the last two years they haven't been right you can never be that confident um i am actually that confident in my model (laughs) actually um so as much as i may have criticized the houston texans last year yeah they did trade up for a 90th plus percentile model guy like really high percentage of hitting. So I so there is this world where I am that confident in the model that we, I feel like you can stretch things a little bit. Now, that's the first thing. Secondly, when I've tested the model, I have done it through that lens of like, what if I would never draft like this. I would never take Puka who, I would never take him in the first round, right? I wouldn't do that. 
Um, but I've tested it as such and said, okay, if the model, you know, trust the model, just take this, this player who would never go in the first round, and, and what would the results look like? And the results over time would be better than the regular you know, NFL results. So I do think it might work. But ignoring the consensus board, I think, is, is losing a really important data point. But now you are – so the, the thing becomes now essentially how, um, how much you can let him slip. Because it's, it's essentially now about maximizing the advantage, right? Like at the point where you're so confident that – let's say the mo- – let's use Puka Nakua as an example. Let's say the model had him – where was he in the model? I mean, he was it a – liked him, but, it, you know, what did it say about him exactly? I mean, I don't, I don't, the model doesn't put guys into rounds. Right. But it had him as a good, a good prospect. Not right. great. I'm not, okay. he was not like necessarily like a model. So let's hit, say, say, let's say. A, a better a, example is Kobe, if you want to use Kobe Turner. Okay. Same team. Um, he, again, I keep forgetting. I think he was expected to go fourth or fifth and he went in the third. Right. That's the trickier one because I feel like we would, right, but I would so miss on him. Go ahead. Let's say there's a guy that the model pegs as a first round talent should go in the top 10 somewhere but as a consensus like fourth or fifth rounder right um if you're so confident that this guy is going to be really really good based off the model's data now your question becomes well how how far can i let him slide before i have to take him because i can't guarantee somebody else won't so kobe turner being a good example of that right supposed to go in the fourth or fifth i my thing says i can take him in the top half of the first round and still get it, you know, and it, and it makes sense. That's where he belongs. But I know nobody's going to pick him in the first round. Nobody's going to pick him in the second round. But now I have to start going, can I let him go through the, f- the third round and still know I'm going to get him in the fourth? Like, when, when do I have to take him because I can no longer guarantee that somebody else won't? It's a, it's, so it's a great question. I would, I would say I'd be comfortable pretty much going around early on those third, fourth, fifth round players. The second round, like a guy that's supposed to go in the second that you love, I think because at the at the high the higher you on the draft, I think you have better information, and you just kind of like stick to the same round. So the way I've generally tested it, again, if you if you trust these evaluations, if you take a guy when he's the best player available in the expected round that he's going to get drafted. So for me last year, this I don't know if this would work out well. Marvin Mims or Josh Downs would be drafted high in the second. Like if I had the 38th pick, they'd be drafted high in the second. Might not, and they ended up going much later because um, that's where they were on the consensus board. On the other hand, Turner, I'm trying to find where he was consensus-wise. Um, but again, his consensus was way lower. He went higher than, than expected. And I would, be, I would be livid if my guy, if I didn't get Kobe Turner last year right and someone else liked him more than me yeah so he was 149th on the consensus board and he went 90th so kobe turner at 149 my normal suggested strategy what's that the fifth my normal suggested strategy would be take him in the four you know middle of the fourth or the fifth he would be like the jumping off the board guy to take but the rams beat you to it at pick 90 i would be livid so i would say it's okay to take those guys around early, and I think the confidence in the evaluation is warranted historically that you can get away with that. That's right. my answer. Cool. That's a good. I mean, it's a really, it's a great discussion. I mean, it's it's a model based question. I you're you're. I get excited. The source. I get excited, but generally, I the, the I put up I put the Hori board together, and I say there's there's going to be guys who are 90th percentile players in the fourth, fifth, sixth round, like Ivan Pace yeah. last year. He goes undrafted. Right. He would have been my sprint to the podium player in the fifth round last year, right? But he goes he goes undrafted, and then you have Kobe Turner. He'd be my sprint to the podium player in that same round as well, or around that time. Um, but he went higher. So, uh, next question: Patrick Wayman asks, "Are we reaching a period of such untold wide receiver bounty in the draft that teams can start to approach the position essentially like used cars, buy a guy, get some cheap use out of it, and then flip it for similar money before doing it all over again?" Sort of the way we once suggested that the Baltimore Ravens should treat pass rushers. You know, the way they were able to like manufacture a ten sack season out of any edge rusher they had. We speculated for a while that they might start playing that game, right? Draft a guy get 10 sacks out of him in a career year, let him walk in free agency for a big money contract, get the comp pick back, and just keep going. Have we reached the point now where that's a strategy for wide receivers? You, it's so easy now to find wide receivers in the draft. Every year we're saying, 
this is the best wide receiver class to come along in years. Can we just let these guys walk? Like, can we all trade away Tyreek Hill or Justin Jefferson or Stephon Diggs or whoever we want and just re-up? Um, I would. I, I like this strategy, but not for the guys that you mentioned. Not for wide receiver ones. And I know. I know we're coming off a two-year period where trading Tyree Kill was absolutely the right move for the Chiefs. I don't think that's the right move for other teams. And though. Diggs. Diggs was the right move for the Vikings, but it was also. But it was also the right move for the Bills. It was also the right move for the Bills. I don't think the the Vikings. I don't think. It was fine. Look, I say this all the time, right? The high-level strategy of you have a guy for four years, you get something out of him, and you flip him for a first. Over time, that makes the team better. But the idea that you can just find the next Justin Jefferson, that's, that's, not, uh, that's, a, that's a prayer, not a strategy. That just worked for Minnesota, that they, that they got Jefferson. Because if the Eagles just make a different decision and draft Jefferson, then the Vikings strategy doesn't work, right? So it's dependent on other things. I, I think for the second-tier receivers... I think it makes sense because those guys are easier to find. I still think wide receiver one has such a massive impact that you want to have one of those guys. Um, the tricky part there is the price tag, though, right? That's where you might say, okay, that it does make sense to move on from Tyree Kill or Justin Jefferson because we're going to be able to get two or three players for him, and that will work out over time. But I would keep the wide receiver ones, and I don't hate the idea of cycling through Anyone who's not a top twenty-ish type of receiver. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that was my question: is where does that where does that tier end, and where do you get to the next guys? Like, the Colts just re-signed Michael Pittman Jr. to a pretty monster contract. Um, I think it depends on what you have on the team. Too. So that's the thing, right? Do, do teams just need to get more proactive of this, right? Like Michael Pittman Jr. is now getting twenty-three and a bit million dollars a year on average. It kind of feels like you can get another Michael Pittman Jr. in the draft. You know. Not I thought easily, but you got a pretty good shot at it. I thought the I thought Keenan Allen and Mike Williams and look Williams has been hurt quite a bit. But Mike Keenan, Williams would have been the next guy I brought up, right? Like, what did the the Jets just give him to be wide receiver two? Twelve. Yeah, yeah. Like instead of twelve million on Mike Mike Williams, do you just draft a guy? But I thought where they were they were in the low twenties with the Chargers. They, they were twenty. My uh, yeah, Mike Williams was on twenty. I think they were right the at twenty. Him and. Keenan Allen, they felt like the uh, Matt Ryan, Kirk Cousins inflection point for receivers, for me, where those guys felt fine at 20, and strategically, I liked that they were both on the same team, right? Like I, I like that as a strategy with your rookie contract quarterback, Herbert. Obviously, it didn't work, but I, th- I think that's the type of receiver. Like, Where would you rank Keenan Allen as a receiver, 15 or 20? In, over the course of the last few years, as far as impact, I know he catches a ton of balls. He's a great possession receiver. That's where he is. That's where Mike Williams is. I think that's the cutoff. And I then sort of feel like the Michael Gallup's of the world, the I hate to say it, but Corey Davis's of the world, you get the production out of those guys and let them walk. Yeah, I've I've argued the other side of this previously. Like I actually I think a team needing a wide receiver, going and making that AJ Brown trade, trading for Brandon Ayuk now would be the best thing you can do rather than try and grab one with a first-round pick because the chances are those guys are going to be significantly better than anybody you can draft in the first round. That's what I'm saying. So the Vi- real quick, the Viking strategy of like, oh, just draft the next Justin Jefferson, that was basically lucky. that they. I mean, you know, some, some level of luck. Carry on. But I feel like the other thing you should be doing is almost every year you should be treating it like the Packers did last year and draft two wide receivers, like every single year. Make sure you have 10 draft picks every year and spend two of them on wide receivers. And the chances are one of those guys is going to be pretty useful. And then every year you are adding at least one very useful wide receiver to your receiving core so that when a Michael Pittman Jr. or whatever is hitting free agency, now you have three or four guys sitting behind him and you're pretty confident at least one of those guys can step into the Michael Pittman Jr. role and you don't have to pay him $23 million a year to make that happen. I mean, that's the other piece of the Packers strategy that we always cite, the double dipping at positions. They double dip at positions that are volume driven, right? Receiver, you know, you want to be four and five deep. At corner, you want to be four and five deep. They double dip at positions that need depth, not necessarily a tackle where you have two starters. Right. Right. Not necessarily at the positions where and the worst thing that can happen they're not going to have an impact. Yeah. The worst thing you can happen is that every single pick you do, none of them come good. But the second worst thing that can happen is that all of them do. And that's currently the position they're in where they drafted a bunch of receivers and it turns out all of them are useful. That's not a bad, a bad place to be in if you're the Packers. 
Um, the other aspect of this, if you, I'm trying to, I've got some historical data in front of me. So that's just since 2018. Let me go back to 2015 here. Since 2015, it's actually a little, it's a little bit closer over the last couple of years. But since 2015, the percentage of first round receivers who have become starters. So this is just, um, and I've defined starters as 500 plus snaps per season over the period of time that you played, just to keep it simple. 63% uh, of first round receivers become starters. Fifth, but the second round, it only drops to 56%. Right. 63 to 56. And then third round, you're still finding 35% of third rounders become starters. Now let me just try to grab other positions just for perspective. So 35% of, let me get this out of here. 35% of third rounders become starters, and um, it's much lower at other positions from what I've seen. So you can find starting caliber, and I, I don't like using starter as a, as a baseline. The NFL seems to, right? It speaks to them. That's why I look at it. But it, like, you know, directionally decent, right? These guys play football. That's a pretty good percentage for the third round, whereas something like edge defender, where's edge? Let me use tackle. Tackle drops quite a bit. Where's uh, edge? It drops a ton, right? Like edge is the biggest drop off. This is probably the biggest story since 2015, right? Your starters, first rounders become starters 61% of the time. Second round drops to 25% of the time. Third round drops to 21% of the time. That's where the scarcity thing comes in. Right. And that's why we talk about, okay, if you're going to get your edges, it's not, the, it's not that you're – picking them in the first round so that you'll be right. It's just that that's where, you know, historically the NFL tends to pick the best edge rushers. Yeah. All right. Ready for the that. next question? Yeah. Uh, this one is from Dale Chapman. Uh, I've edited it for bre brevity, and it is still fairly long. So as a Washington Commanders fan, full of hope with new ownership, GM, coaching staff, I'm hopeful that new GM Adam Peters learned from and possibly improves the strategy San Francisco used when he got there in 2017. Instead of the ass backward strategy, everybody currently spouts like gospel. Um, the 49ers picked at number two in Peters' first year there. Instead of dumping a rookie quarterback onto a team bad enough to pick in the top 10, they took a short trade bank to pass on quarterback and then went best player available. Uh, then built a, a playoff caliber roster around a veteran before later going after a rookie contract quarterback to elevate the position or free up enough space to add the type of talent to get Mr. Irrelevant to a Super Bowl. Um, that's the only reason San Francisco was able to brush off what could have been a Carolina-level catastrophic trade up and were able to move on and overload the roster with talent. Uh, it's the same process Kansas City went through with Alex Smith before plugging Mahomes in, similar to how Baltimore, Green Bay, and Philly were able to extend playoff relevance after swapping out franchise quarterbacks. Now it looks like the historically bad Detroit Lions are following San Francisco and Kansas City's path to more success than they have ever had. Hitting on a quarterback is rare, and when you start them off on a team that's top 10 bad, it's even rarer. A hit on a quarterback in a, on a top 10 uh, bad roster is just an average quarterback with false hope. So effectively, he's asking that question of everyone saying, you're picking two, you draft your quarterback, should they in fact, and this is Washington, this is New England, which we've speculated a bit more about, should they, in fact, be trying to make a team better and decent and then figuring out the way of getting the quarterback later? Build the roster first. Yeah. Before, and obviously okay. the downside would, of that is you take yourself out of top 10 contention so you can't just draft the guy at number two, but he might actually be able to function. I, I love this question, and I think it's a, it's a very valid one. I would push back on the history, the described history of what happened in San Francisco. The, the true part is they were sitting there at two, did not take a quarterback, of which they could have chosen between Mitchell Trubisky, Patrick Mahomes, right, this is 2017, the, 2017. The Solomon Thomas draft, right? They, yeah, so they traded back one spot, drafted Solomon Thomas. That is absolutely true. They passed on a quarterback. I think the missing data point here is that in that same season, before the trade deadline, they traded for Jimmy Garoppolo, a second-round pick, and paid him a lot of money at the time. Right. Right. So they did. So they didn't do it through the draft, but they still invested heavily at the quarterback position. The other thing was. Before that season, Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch both signed six-year contracts, yes. which was massive at the time, and six also, years. Most GMs are three or four. And that's also similar to Detroit, who had runway, six-year deals. Yes. In Detroit, 
Um, so I think Detroit is absolutely the model of build the infrastructure and then, oh, by the way, Jared Goff's on the roster. Maybe people were sleeping on him. He's still a good, solid quarterback, and they were able to win. Um, and then I'll agree with the point, of course, San Francisco built an absolute juggernaut around Jimmy Garoppolo. But the idea that they were not – so then so then after the juggernaut was built, they felt like they hit a ceiling with Jimmy Garoppolo, both, I think, on the field and because he was rarely on the field. And then they said, now we got to make the power move. Now we have to go get up and get a quarterback, and the power move was to go get Trey Lance. And then they stumbled into Brock Purdy as Mr. Irrelevant. So that's the history there. They still, in 2017, before they had a roster set, made a big move for a quarterback in Jimmy Garoppolo. And then while he was still on the roster, between 2018 and now, they've built a juggernaut, right? So they did not, the Niners didn't spend two or three years building the roster and say, okay, we're going to need a quarterback now. They, they waited like nine weeks or eight, whatever the trading deadline was. So that's the first thing. It is kind of interesting, though. So part of this, um, part of this argument is, you know, you trade out of the, the spot. You trade out of two or three. You don't take the quarterback now because your team isn't good enough to support him. You instead use those picks to build a better roster around, or at least start the build of a better roster. So San Francisco being the team to start that is interesting because they, they did that, I guess, that year. He, you, know, you can argue or, or uh, change the framing of why they did it, right? They already had the quarterback in place in Jimmy Garoppolo, theoretically. But the point being, they didn't draft a quarterback. They traded out. They then used those picks to build that team. But that year, all the, almost all the picks were bad. Like Solomon Thomas was a massive disappointment as the third overall pick. The, the other first-round pick they had was Reuben Foster. Barely who played. Yeah. looked amazing for about five minutes until he ran himself out of the league. Um, after that, in the third round, it was C.J. Beathard. Akello Witherspoon they drafted. I don't think he became good until like later on in his career. Yeah, he had a couple good seasons outside of San Francisco. Yes, so they didn't get anything out of him. Fourth round was Joe Williams running back. That didn't, you know, like... This potentially franchise changing. Now, fifth round, they hit George Kittle. So they got something out of it. Yeah. But theoretically, they had a bunch of picks early in that draft that could have started the foundation of this thing and didn't. Yeah. Like the, the foundation came elsewhere. So I, I don't want to be overly specific to just what the Niners did. I just wanted to make sure that we understood, I think, what their strategy was. But I think the basic premise here is build the roster, then get the quarterback, or get the quarterback, and then build the roster right and I do think it's a viable strategy I, I would I would just hate to because the other the other part of the San Francisco thing is if let's just say they evaluated the quarterbacks differently than Chicago did Chicago took Trubisky yeah at that time it was not a slam dunk I think you know, our official PFF ranking had Trubisky number one we're not yeah. not running away from that but at the time, the narrative on him, Deshaun Watson, and Patrick Mahomes was, ah, it depends on where they land. Anybody could have anybody as a number one. There was no consensus true number one. If they had evaluated the quarterbacks differently from Chicago, then they draft Deshaun Watson or Patrick Mahomes, and they, I think, hit. Now, again, you could make the argument, would Patrick Mahomes ever become Mahomes if he didn't land in Kansas City, sit a year, have Andy Reid, whatever? Maybe. But he'd probably still be really good, <laughs> Mahomes. Right. And, uh, and Deshaun Watson would probably still be really good before, you know, the bad stuff happened. So if they just picked a different quarterback, maybe that would have been better, even though we know that things turned out pretty good for the, for the Niners. So, that, so the, the basic question, though, is build the roster or draft the quarterback. Yeah. I think in either Washington or New England situation, I don't hate it if they had patience especially in the divisions that they're in, right? Washington has to compete with the Eagles and the Cowboys right now. And I think it's fair for them to say 2025 is the first year we want to start really, really competing. And 26 is when we want to be kings of this division. And that's a multi-year you know, piece of work. So I don't hate that. If they get a massive haul, including first-rounders for next year, Washington or New England, because New England can say the same thing. How are we going to overtake Buffalo and Miami and even the Jets right now? How are we going to do that? This is a multi-year problem. Take a haul of picks and load up the roster, and then you know, figure, and then you you take a Michael Penix in the second round just to get somebody in the building, and then you just you know continue to think about the first round quarterback in the future. I I don't hate that as a strategy. I also don't think it's as clear cut. Do one or do the other. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of elements here. It, it used to be the logic 
certainly previously and maybe still now is, and we've we've definitely been. I don't want to say guilty because it's still, I think, a valid proponents. We've been proponents yeah, of the idea that look, you don't get an opportunity to draft a guy like this very often. When you get one, you have to take it. Um, so, you know, the, the, there are teams that have been, there are teams that have struggled to get line of sight through to the next quarterback for years because they're too good to ever be picking in the top three, and yet the guy they have is not good enough to take them where they need to go, so they're kind of stuck in this quarterback hell. And you're like, at some point, you need a way of getting to that spot to draft a guy that could change the whole dynamic, right? Um, And I think there's still an argument to that. But I think what we're seeing in the last few years with some of these teams mentioned is that if maybe the importance of the supporting cast around the guy is actually bit greater than, than has been talked about before, and actually what you simply need is not necessarily the, – the most important thing is, is a cheap quarterback, not necessarily a good one, right? So what you need is the flexibility to build a very good team around him. And this is where a team like Minnesota or the Raiders with Derek Carr or now the Saints with Derek Carr get themselves into trouble. It's not that um, – it's that with those guys on the roster, on the contracts they're on – now you, it's too hard to build that roster. Whereas really what you want is last year's Baker Mayfield, right? You want a quarterback who's not as good as Kirk Cousins, but is getting paid a tenth of what Kirk Cousins is getting paid. So now you have a quarterback earning four to six million playing at a half decent level. Now you can use that money and invest everywhere else and you can build a team around them. And even if you can't, then if, even if you then take yourself out of that quarterback market, you've built such a juggernaut that you can find somebody that can give you that level of play that's not transcendent, not transformative, but actually allows you to still be a really good team and threaten those sides. I think the problem is if you do it the other way, where you go get the quarterback first, either through investing big money in him, Kirk Cousins, free agency, or by drafting the guy number two overall, you either become financially not flexible enough to maintain the kind of roster around that guy he needs, So the Vikings paid him a ton of money thinking that they had a championship caliber roster, which they did in 2017, right? Case Keenum almost took them to a Super Bowl. Right. But as soon as you attach your that contract to the to the salary cap, you can't maintain it. Like it's it gets eroded. So the Vikings roster steadily got chipped away at for a few years as soon as they got cousins and they were never able to get him back there. Uh, Or you do what Carolina did, you trade up, and now you've just taken too much of your roster out to get the quarterback, and now you can't even tell if he's any good or not. So I I sort of feel like that's the thing. There is a logic in as long as you don't invest massively in a quarterback, you can create a roster that's good enough that you can then drop somebody into and be competitive. I want to add two more quick points here. Let's look a couple things that happened historically. Washington, actually, in 2020, when they were merely the football team, not commanders. At number two overall, now they had, um, they had just drafted Dwayne Haskins, the late Dwayne Haskins, in 2019, in the middle of the first round. Then they were picking at number two the next year. There was very little about Haskins' rookie season that said, oh, yeah, definitely, he's the guy. Like, it right. was very much up in the air. And at number two overall, they picked Chase Young, which was the slam dunk consensus. Definitely picked Chase Young. Uh, Best player, best non-quarterback in the draft. The other quarterbacks picked after him, of course, Tua Tungavailoa at five, Justin Herbert at six. At the time, because they had just drafted a quarterback the year before, of course nobody was expecting them to draft a QB, and they didn't have a great roster in 2019. That's why they were picking at two. And then they actually did make the playoffs in 2020 as you know Chase Young's rookie year. But the point is, should they have been drafting Tua or drafting, or drafting Justin Herbert because how often do you get to pick it two and you don't know what you're missing right. out on there, right? Similarly, the Jets in 2021, they draft Zach Wilson at two. Obviously, that didn't work out. But what's the alternative, right? So like when the, when the commanders don't take a quarterback and they pick Chase Young, they had one good season with Young and then they're just middling and five years later, they're still looking for a quarterback, four years later, still looking for a QB for that franchise. The Jets, they took Zach Wilson at two. Of course they did. Most people had him as QB two. It's failed miserably. Okay, so everybody's, oh, you know, don't pick busts at quarterback. Yeah, yeah, fine. Okay, what did this do to the Jets roster? What if they had drafted a non-quarterback? What if they drafted Jamar Chase was out there or Micah Parsons? 
Well, what would the Jets roster look like a few years later? It would just have one more elite player. The, I'm, I'm pulling the best players. Jamar Chase, Micah Parsons, Panay Sewell, Patrick Sertan. Take any non-quarterback elite player. Are the Jets any different as a franchise now versus then? They would have one more elite player, still have no quarterback, until they went and found, you know, traded for Aaron Rodgers. Right. right? So they're still in the same spot. You just you you you'd have you'd add one more elite player, which would be nice after you get Aaron Rodgers, but it doesn't it's not that big of a difference for the franchise. So yeah, in order to you have to look at what the alternative is, right? And so when San Francisco did this, they obviously only traded down one spot for a they were essentially passing on a quarterback anyway. So they that trade was interesting because they basically stole picks out of Chicago for nothing. Like they were already they were gonna draft Solomon Thomas at two. If right. they didn't get a right. trade, the Bears essentially just blinked thinking they had to get up to two for no good reason. Right. right? Uh, this is different because if Washington decides they're open for business at two, they're gonna get a trade from somebody picking at 11, 12, 13, that's a big trade haul. So yes. let's say, for example, their alternative is Drake May, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy at two overall versus you're going to get, if, you're, if it's the Vikings, for example, who are the most talked about team currently trading up, they're going to get pick 11, they're going to get pick 23, they're going to get next year's first for a team that might stink next year, uh, and probably something else, because I yeah. think that maybe only gets you to three. Probably more. Two. You're going to get more than what the Texans right. gave up last year. So at the minimum, you're starting with three first-round picks plus whatever other bells and whistles get thrown onto that, right, versus the quarterback, right? And what's interesting to me, if you we used this previously looking at the team needs, but just as an overall strength of roster thing, Mike Clay's uh, composite you know, unit rankings rolled all together – the commander's roster right now ranks uh, 29th in Mike Clay's thing. So we're talking about a, a roster that currently ranks 29th in the NFL. Do you want to stick a young quarterback onto that? Or do you want to take at least three first-round picks, use two of those first-round picks this year, plus whatever else you get, to bring in good players to try and move that roster forward, and then either next year it's appealing. or somewhere down the line find the quarterback. It's very appealing, man. It is. I mean, and, and you could say, well, we don't know what next year's quarterback class is. It looks like right. trash. At the same time, nobody knew off the top of my head. Nobody knew that Joe Burrow was going to do what he did. Kyler Murray, what he did. Nobody knew Josh Allen really was going to be and what last, he was. And the last class we thought was a generationally good class, which some people are talking about this class as, was 2021 where four out of the five first-rounders have already been dumped as starters, and the fifth one is seen as a disappointment yeah. relative to the gen, like the best quarterback since Peyton Manning type well, of talk. Last thing, too, because, again, the, the results of this stuff are so much luck, right? Yeah. Because the Bears, last year, they had this decision, and we were on record saying, yeah, we, we like Bryce Young enough that you take a chance on Bryce Young, and if you don't love him, you take a chance on the quarterback the next year. And they said, no, we'll roll with Fields for one more year, trade one for a massive haul, you get D.J. Moore, you get – uh, Darnell Wright, and you get the number one overall pick this year, who happens to be Caleb Williams, who, again, people think are, is a better prospect than Bryce Young. So obviously trading out worked for the Bears because they, again, lucked out that the Panthers were the worst team in the NFL and yeah. got the number I mean, last one overall year, pick. Last year you got a perfect example of how, um, how luck-driven, I guess, all this is, right, with the two trades that gave teams extra first-round picks. You had the Texans who Arizona made that trade thinking we might get, this might be a top three pick, right? We're trading out of yeah. the spot. This is good for us because we're not picking them anyway. We're trading out of the spot. We're picking up a, f a first next year and heading into the season, Arizona was odds on to have the number one and the number two overall pick, right? They were supposed to be the worst team in the NFL and the Texans were supposed to be the second worst team in the NFL. And instead they end up picking, where are they, 27? Something 27. like that? Yeah. So. That pick ended up like 25 picks worse than it was supposed to be for them, right? And then the flip side of that is Carolina. The Chicago ends up with the number one overall pick, having done a deal where they wouldn't have thought it was anything like that. They would have thought, yeah, Carolina's got their quarterback. They're going to be a middle-of-the-pack team. We might have the number one overall pick as a terrible team ourselves. But the other one, you know, that they, their pick for the start of the season was the Bears were going to go taking the number one pick. And instead, they end up with that from Carolina. So... If you're Washington and you're factoring in this deal from Minnesota or Denver or the Raiders or whoever, that first-round pick next year could be anything. Like, that could be 
we they're actually quite good now because we gave them the quarterback and we're picking in the low 20s or that could be this team stinks because they just did what the Panthers did and we're getting the number one overall pick next year this debate feels similar to the should you start or sit a quarterback yeah boy, there is no right answer there's data on both sides yeah well, Mahomes sad and Brady sad well Peyton played his whole career you know you just go back and forth between data points right, right? and is I don't think there's anything clear cut and there's also not enough examples like there's not enough data points to say it's clearly one way or the other um, that's why I think my my nature is generally to say take your chances on quarterback but also make sure that you're then trading back trading back trading back accumulating draft picks so that you could build the roster around him and try to because you're trying to do both right it's a push pull tug you know tug of war type deal you have to add as many assets to the team as you can while taking swings at quarterback. Yeah, I have to say, I do think that my thinking on it has changed over the last few years. I was definitely always of the opinion that if you're picking number two overall, you don't pick number two. Most teams don't pick number two overall very often, right? Yeah. So when you have that chance, take it. Take it. Take the quarterback. It doesn't even matter if you love the guy or not because we're bad enough at identifying quarterbacks that you might, you're might you better off just taking the swing that you might be wrong in your evaluation. Like you have, There's a bigger chance that you're wrong about your evaluation than there is that you're right about it, and you should be basing your analysis on that. So take the quarterback. I am, however, now thinking that it actually depends what the offer is, right? If you're getting an like, so if, if Washington's only offer on the table is from like New England, to move down one spot, take the quarterback. No, but like if there's a massive haul, right? But I, if the, I think if it's the a offer fair on the table discussion. is from yeah. Minnesota or yeah. somebody that far down, right? And they are offering you at least three first round picks and some other stuff, right? Whether it's a player, whether it's a couple other picks. Like at this point, there's value to that. Particularly, this draft's also interesting because we had a bet come in actually on this topic. But if you if you want defense. The first defender might not come off the board till 11. Like, you might, it might last that long yeah. before you get a defender of any description. So, if, like, if you're looking at this, there would be drafts where if you drop from number two to number 11, you're taking, like, the, the top four players you're interested in are already gone by the time you're looking. Now, if you're watching and you said, okay, if we don't take a quarterback, what do we want? It's going to be edge rushers. It could be corner. Like, it's all the positions you're looking at then – are there at that point. You might get the top guy off the board at any one of those spots. Right. So that changes it as well. It's not, it's not the same year every year, like every single year. I, the one other thing I'll throw in there um, is Michael Penix Jr. and Bo Nix, I think, are kind of wild cards in this draft because th- there's now a clear top four, apparently. Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy. I think there's still going to be people that really like Michael Penix and really like Bo Nix. Don't forget Spencer Rattler. And Spencer Rattler. Okay, so now there's these this this sec, let's call it the second tier of quarterbacks. And if you know, depending on the draft grades, if you don't think there's a massive difference, right? right? If there's not a game changing difference between Drake May, Jaden Daniels, JJ McCarthy, and then Penix and Nix, or even Rattler, then you don't hate taking one of those guys with a second first round pick at twenty if they traded with Minnesota at pick twenty three. You're taking a Michael Penix Jr. in the second round. You're taking a Michael Penix Jr. While you have all these other draft picks. Now, again, the hit rate on that is probably lower, you know, picking QB5 or QB6. But it's like, all right, we'll take a shot, and we'll get all these other picks. We'll have next year's first rounder in the whole deal. So, look, I'm, I'm more convinced that Washington and New England, there is a viable strategy for them to trade down. I am more convinced, and, and there's two reasons, the division – where they are in the division, I think they're both the clear – well, Washington's the third best team in their division. I think New England's the clear four in their division. And you got to have patience there. Um, and then just what the massive ho- – because there's so much desperation around yeah. the rest of the NFL the right now. The final element that we didn't touch on here is that I do think – and this shouldn't be a factor, but it is – the security of the person making the call – is relevant. So you mentioned San Francisco had the six-year deal. The Detroit guys got given a six-year deal to start. Adam Peters has a five-year contract to start. Like the the Patriots are a new regime now, right? Having the runway to be able to do this, I think, is important. Like if there are teams out there where if this was the strategy, they don't have they don't have the the, the, the capacity to see it through, right? The they're on two-year deals. They're getting to the end of it. They don't have credit in the bank. They're not at the start of whatever project this is. They need an answer now, and they have to take a swing, right? They have to gamble on it. 
there are other teams where I think you can realistically sell a longer term strategy. And this year specifically, I think both the teams we're talking about, Washington and New England, have that ability. Like both of those teams, I think, could sell ownership on this is how we're doing this this year, right? We're not taking a quarterback this year. This is going to be a two or three year project. Are you cool with that? And I think in both cases, they could sell owners on that. I would say, though, that the, the human element of those two teams is far more in Washington's favor to be patient than New England. I think New England, with, with Robert Kraft, he's coming off of Belichick leaving, them not winning a playoff game since Brady left, Kraft getting older, all the, all the rumors and everything about him really caring about his ego and getting into the Hall of Fame. Like I don't know that Robert Kraft can stomach two more losing seasons <laughs> without at least a quarterback to hope for, to hope with, to come out of those two losing seasons. You know what I mean? I feel like it's going to be much harder for New England to stomach. You have Mayo trying to replace Belichick. Like if he has two bad years, he's out of there, right? Mayo probably doesn't have a a long term opportunity here just because of impatience. Whereas the Commanders have fresh new owner in Josh Harris, the long term contract for Peters, uh, you know, loaded division with the two teams at the top. So I think the human element of it favors the Commanders being more patient. And, and if you're Minnesota, I mean, you're obviously making a lot of calls if you do want to actually trade up. But I think you might actually have a better opportunity getting to two with Washington than you are getting to three with New England, knowing how those, those teams are built. That's it. Yep. Uh, let me put you on the spot. Great. Uh, Malik Neighbors has his pro day today and will be running a 40. What time do you believe he will clock in the 40? 4 3 9. 4 3 9 to 4 4 1. Wow. That's <laughs> it's a big range. It's not that big. That's what I mean. It's, in fact, two one hundredths of a second. Yeah. It's a tiny range. Yeah. Yeah. I was that's my, fantastic. Oh, okay. I mean, some people, I mean, they, oh, my watch had 4 4. I had 4 4 1. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, 4 3 9 to 4 4 1 is, in fact, about as small a range as you could possibly have. Yeah. That's how confident I am. That's yeah. my confidence level. I 4 3 believe, 9 to 4 4 1. I believe that's slow. Slow? I believe you're oh, be nice. much closer to 4 3 flat. They're yelling back there. They are. Yeah. I don't know if that's four like three. If he runs 4-3, he's first wide receiver off the board. You think? Yeah. Okay. I think he'll be close to 4-3 flat. If he runs 4-3-5 or faster, he's first wide receiver off the board. Uh, you believe he should be or you just think he will be? Will be. Okay. That's a prediction. Um, and it's fascinating because if, if Marvin Harrison Jr. just went out there and ran 4-4-5... Four, four, he would be the first receiver off the board. <laughs> All he had to do, if he just ran 4 4 5 or 4 4 9, even, you know, but he didn't run anything. And if Neighbors goes out and puts a four and a three with a decimal in between the two, yeah, he's the fir- anything in the four threes, he's the first receiver off the board, I think. Which just brings up a whole nother unbelievable discussion that we can ramble about. But the way the human brain works with this stuff. It is the. It's got to be. It's it's very difficult as an evaluator to not let. Like I already told you, Malik Davis is fast. Yeah. You already watched him play football. You know he's fast. We have data points that say he's as fast as any receiver in the nation when playing football. Yep. Right. It's already accounted for. It's already there. But now you've seen it. But he's going to go today, and he puts a four and a point and a three, and if that happens. Yep. People are flipping them. They're flipping the whole thing. The, whole, the, the evaluation changes. It, whereas if he runs a 4-4 something, then you say, eh, no, you're right. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the guy. So is that where Harrison loses out by essentially saying, I don't need to do it. Teams are happy. Teams see the, the tracking data. They don't need the thing. Does he actually miss out because he doesn't double count himself? He doesn't put it out. He doesn't put the fact that he can run that fast. Yeah, on it's tape still, it still is a factor. People. I went, I, I can't, I wish I could replicate the rant that I went on yesterday with, I was talking to some of our data science guys and just how we, we've done this on the show before. It was like the Trayvon Walker pro day thing. You just, your brain disproportionately weighs these things. Right. Right. Cause when you're weighing, what's a gut feel when the coach is like, Oh, I used my gut. You're doing some sort of mental calculation, right? So your mental math is what is just disproportionate to reality, which is why when you have like an actual model that has say 30 inputs, the 40 time is gonna be a small little input 
unless unless it historically actually correlates to, to success. It doesn't. So if you're doing something with a model, no matter what Malik Neighbors runs or Marvin Harrison Jr. runs, it's going to make like a slight move in your baseline evaluation, right? Slight movement. But in your brain's mental math here, it's going to be a massive move. I'm, I'm going to be guilty of it too. I'm like, oh, Neighbors runs a 4-3-3 or 4-3-2. Oh, maybe I should have him as wide receiver one. Like I'm going to have that conversation with myself. Whereas if you do something mathematically, it's only going to have a, it's, it should have a much smaller impact than whatever your um, your brain is telling you. Yeah, which like is, which is interesting. It's one thing for NFL teams to tell Marvin Harrison Jr. that they have every inf- piece of information they need. They don't need him to run a forty. It's another thing to say for a definitive fact that if he did run a forty and ran a four three flat, that wouldn't change how they would draft him. Yeah, like I they mean, might say that no, I wouldn't change anything, but. It might. It was two things. Like him sitting out, there's two ways it can go. You might be leaving. Like, if he did run a high 4 fours, they might be like, oh, that's kind of slow. But then you're also going up against your competition who's going to go and run a 4-3, as you're, as you're predicting. Those two things could be working against Marvin Harrison Jr. here. Yeah. What your competition's doing. Right. It's also just one thing to say, like, even if these numbers match 100% what they have in terms of tracking data or estimates or whatever in their minds... It's one thing to say that that won't change your evaluation. Another thing, as soon as you're presented with the actual data, to be like, oh, actually, now. Yeah. Well, and, and look, I th- again, I think all those data points are valid, right? Like, whatever Neighbors runs, I think, is an important data point. It's just not as important as we're probably going to discuss it or talk right. about it. Or like, we knew, it. we knew Xavier Worthy was fast as hell from his tape. Him breaking the combine record is probably going to change his draft position. All, so what I'm saying, the other part of the Worthy thing is, when you do things mathematically, it's very difficult for the difference between a four two one and a four three to be weighed that high, right? Because mathematically, it's not that big of a difference. It's not going to affect something if you're if you're doing something from a model perspective. It does. It makes a big impact when you say it's the best ever. We've never, you know, it's a four two one, right? We'd never see anything that low. We've seen other guys do a four three. So that in that part, it makes a big impact. All right, ready? We've got data points coming in. Not the forty yet. But he's he's done his vertical. Malik Neighbors with a 42-inch vertical. I was going to say 41. Oh, now, oh, let me plug it in. Which is the tied for the third among wide receivers this year's combine. So okay, it's Jalen effective. Coker. All of, but that ha, to me that has I, I, what, what, uh, where are the correlations. Let me They're find tight. my receiver correlations. The vertical and 40 have a tight correlation. Having said that, Jalen Coker is tied for the best vertical in this year's wide receiver class, and he ran a not a good 40, right? Yeah, I don't think so. Well, he had a weird that, thing where his 40 time was, yeah, 4 five, seven. He had the a, correlations here? He had a bad 40 time, but an amazing vertical and 10-yard split. He's got one of these data sets that doesn't make any sense. Let's anyway, see. point being, Malik Neighbor so far, 42-inch vertical. That's suggesting the dude's going to be fast. Me just flying through paperwork here. Yeah. This great show. These this are always the best pieces of the show where you're just sifting defense. through your reams of paperwork. It looks cooler when I just throw them right all next over to the, the microphone place. as well. It's right perfect. next to the mic, so you can yeah. hear it. So you can hear that I'm working. Yeah. Where's my? I don't see my off. I don't have the offensive correlations. But I think, I mean, because there's been so many fast receivers who are overdrafted. It, on paper, the forty doesn't have a great correlation to success. Right. But it ha- no, my my thing was it has a very tight correlation to vertical. Which to is, vertical, yeah, yeah. Which he's just shown us is pretty spectacular. Have? Offensive players on this sheet. We, we really this is we got to go. I got a meeting right now anyway. Yeah, but honestly, I think that the the vertical probably has a bigger impact in his projection for me, his vertical or his um, for the shuttle model. and his cone for the model than the forty time would. But that's just that's me. All right, that's all we got. All righty, is this it? Oh yeah, here we go. Oh now we find it. Great. I do have a meeting right here in a minute. Let's see. Receiver correlations to war. Yeah, 40 is decent. 0.132. It's not bad. I mean, it's not good. 40 is a little bit better than shuttle and cone. And it's similar to vertical. None of them have a massive impact. The 10 and the 20, though, higher correlations to war. 10 and 20. So I need those splits. So Coker had a good 10. Give me the splits. Don't have a 20, but he had a good 10. Give me the splits. Then I'll, then I'll get it. All right, there we go. I got Organize the papers at the end of the show. That's what they used to do on the news. This is hateful sound. For the oh, yeah, I can't people. hit the table. I'm not supposed to hit the table. 
I'm sorry. Let's get out of here. Tomorrow, we're ranking running backs. Get ready. Let's go. Tell your friends. Running back rankings tomorrow on the PFF NFL podcast. We'll see you then. Thanks for tuning in.